Jesus is our wisdom. Jesus is our righteousness. Jesus is our sanctification. And Jesus is our redemption. If you have your Bible, if you want to turn to 1 Corinthians this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is a message we started up at winter camp. We just got back from winter camp, took 65 people up to Lake Tahoe for the last four days. It's been fantastic. And um, I reference 1 Corinthians quite a bit in my preaching, but I've never preached a message on 1 Corinthians. So it's been uh, just a joy for me to be able to study this deeper and think about it and be able to present it to you. And it's an awesome, awesome chapter in the Bible. And it's a chapter that mainly deals with unity. How do we become a unified people? And we live in a time where unity is, is lacking, uh, lacking in our country, lacking in our homes, lacking in our personal lives, lacking in many marriages. It's interesting, last month they had the impeachment of the president. They had a, conducted a, a hearing and the results were 229 out of 233 Democrats, who are Congress people, voted for impeachment. 229 out of 233, and 195 out of 197 Republican Congress people voted not to impeach uh, the president. That's fascinating to me. These are our elected representatives. These are people that are we put our trust in to protect us and lead us as a country. They're given the same exact information and they're totally polarized. That's fascinating to me, whether whatever political party you are. According to Ecclesiastes, um, unity is a key to progress. The gospel teaches us that unity is essential to peace, and the one place God desires for there to be peace, to be unity, is in his church. Jesus actually prays in John 17 at the end of his prayer for us. He prays that we would have unity, that we would be one, just as he and the Father are one. And he's given us his glory that we would be one. And he says, when we're one, when the church has unity, the world will know that you really did send me. So the unity for the church is, a, is a, a testimony to Christ's reality, the unity we have as a people. The unity of the church is a reflection of God's glory because Jesus says he's given us his glory that we would be one. And the church's unity will reveal God's love for all mankind. They'll see our love for one another. Last week, Aragon preached a message on the Christian basics out of Acts chapter 2. Now, if you remember, at the end of the sermon, he quoted somebody by saying, this is the church in its age of innocence, where they were getting together and enjoying fellowship and enjoying eating together and enjoying studying the Bible together. And they said they sensed God's this wonder amongst them as they gathered that first church, this age of innocence. Well, then what would happen to Christ's church? What would happen 10 years later? What would happen 20 years later? Okay, and that's where we're at in 1 Corinthians, 20 years after that first chapter of Acts, see what happens with the church. And time's ticking by, the gospel's growing, the inertia of redemption is uh, rapidly taking place, and we're here 2,000 years later enjoying redemption. But what would be the answer to Christ's prayer? What would the church look like as she matured out of the age of innocence? So in 1 Corinthians, Paul has his normal greetings to churches. He's gracious. He's encouraging. And then in verse 10, he confronts the problem. He confronts the problem. So the letters to the churches are to deal with issues the churches are having. 
So in 1 Corinthians, 10, 1 Corinthians 1, 10, we read this. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree. And that word agree means to say the same thing. I want you all to say the same things. Your speech, how you talk about God, how you talk about church, how you talk about life, should be real similar, church. And that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it's been reported to me by Chloe's people (laughs) that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. And what I mean is that each one of you, each one of you, every one of you in the church has this problem. You say, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas. Cephas is Peter, Apostle Peter. Or I follow Christ. Christians don't need to say, I follow Christ, (laughs) is what we do, right? It's weird to say I'm a Christian and I follow Christ. Just say you're a Christian, or just say you follow Christ, one or the other. Is Christ divided? We're the body of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? So the problem was division in the church. And fast forward 2,000 years... And we say things like, well, I'm a Baptist, or I'm a Presbyterian, I'm a Lutheran, I'm non-denominational, I'm of Calvary Chapel. And there's the super spiritual people. I'm not part of a church, I just follow Christ in the Bible. Well, if that's true, Christ says to belong to a church, so. Or we say things like, well, I, I follow John MacArthur, I follow John Piper, I follow Tim Keller, I follow Bill Johnson, I follow some man. Or there's the super spiritual that say, well, I just follow the Holy Spirit. I have no teacher. They're out there too. Still division. This kind of division is a result of pride. One of the words for pride in the New Testament is is deception. Pride is deceiving. It's like a smoke screen. It doesn't allow us to see correctly as we ought to see. And pride, basically, at the root of it is my way is the right way. My teacher is the right teacher. My denomination is the right denomination. My church is the right church. And this is the default button of our, of our humanity. <laughs> we want to do what's right. I've yet to meet somebody that says, I want to do what's wrong. I want to follow a wrong teacher. I want to go to a wrong church. I want to be part of a wrong denomination, right? People don't say that. We don't, that's not our, how we're wired. We want to do what's right. So how are we going to fix this problem? What's Paul going to do? What's Paul going to teach these people to help them understand unity? and humility, to get them over this hump of division that they're in. He's going to do it. He's going to humble us. The Holy Spirit's going to humble us by teaching us about the mystery and the power of the gospel. Okay? He's going to teach us the mystery and the power of the gospel. And in 1 Corinthians, I'll just be honest, this, this chapter might cause more questions in your thinking than answers. And all I have to say to that is, welcome to the Bible, okay? And I stop where the Bible stops. You could take some of this reasoning and go really far and weird places. But God doesn't do that. The secret things belong to the Lord. He's revealed to us what he wants us to know. And there's some things in here that are going to humble you and they're going to break you down. Because that's what you need. And some people don't want to teach some of this stuff because they don't want to get into it because it can, it can cause more questions than answers. But my job is to just give you the scriptures. And you do what, what you want, but here it is. It's pretty awesome. I think this is oh, it's awesome. All right? 
So Paul's going to create a case in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17 down to 31. I'm going to show you the case he's making. And you can see it when I read it, I'm going to circle the words for. For is one of the most used words in this. Okay, so for, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers, Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So this whole argument is to get us to the bottom of this argument, to these two places, so that, so that... I'm telling you all this, you people who are divisive and don't have unity in the church, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Don't boast in your denomination, don't boast in your human teacher, don't boast in your church, boast in the Lord. Why? No human teacher can give you redemption, sanctification, righteousness, and wisdom from God. No church can give that to you. No human can give that to you. No denomination can give that to you. Only Christ can give that to you. It's awesome. So, at its core, this is a lesson on humility. And from humility comes unity, and from unity comes God's peace, and from God's peace comes blessing, and from blessing comes progress, and brought progress to glory. So one of the most repeated phrases in the Bible is this, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Old Testament, New Testament. In other words, God, the God who made Bodega Bay, is actively opposing proud people right now. And he's actively giving grace to the humble right now. What side do you want to be on? How are you going to be humble? Right? Understand what Paul's saying here. Understand what God's saying. And you can apply this to a church. You can apply this to work. You can apply this to school. You can apply this to the team you're on. Anywhere God has you working with other people, You can apply these things that Paul's teaching here. There's two key insights into the plan of God. So Paul's going to take us basically kind of behind the curtain and show us things that God did and God is doing. And it's, it's, 
mind-blowing things, but God wants us to know these things so that we'll be humble. So two key insights into the plan of God to humble mankind. And the first key insight is this. God uses a foolish message. God uses a foolish message. Verse 18, the word of the cross, that's the gospel, that Christ came and died for our sin and rose again. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. When you hear the gospel preached, when you hear about Christ, there's two, two choices you can make. There's no middle ground. Either this is foolishness and weird and crazy, or this is God's plan of salvation. There's no neutral. You don't get to read about Christ and go, he's a good dude. I'm glad he came. I'm glad I get to learn about him. It's either crazy or it's God's power. If you are a Christian, you believe in a God who was tortured and humiliated on a wooden cross. Down in verse 21, Paul writes, For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. It's a foolish message. There's two reasons it's foolish, two ways the gospel's foolish. First of all, God dying is foolish. This idea that God could die makes no sense. Christians are weird because Christians wear crosses. Christians get crosses tattooed on their body. Christian churches have crosses in them. People in Christian homes have sometimes painting of crosses or crosses in their house. That's weird. And the reason it's weird is because the cross was the worst form of torture that somebody could go through. It was reserved for the worst criminals. So it would be like today, it would be like us having pictures of electric chairs in our houses or wearing jewelry with like needles that can be lethal injections. It's weird. The cross is weird. It's, it's, just, it's difficult. The second way the gospel is folly is because it eliminates human good works. It eliminates, it eliminates human good works, good works. Every religion, other than Christianity, teaches that the way to God, the way to heaven, is to work your way there. Climb the ladder. Get to heaven. Christianity teaches there's nothing you can do to earn it. In fact, instead of climbing the ladder to God, Christ came down the ladder to us and worked for us and was perfect for us and was righteous for us and was sanctified for us. So it's folly to the world that we can be saved, that we can be forgiven without our works. So, those who are being saved, we see it as the power of God. Is that because Christians are smarter than other people? That we figured it out? Or is it because Christians are more gullible than the rest of the world? Neither. The Bible says it's because God opened our eyes to see the plan of salvation. 
that Jesus lived a perfect life. He sacrificed himself for us on the cross. He rose again to prove that his death satisfied the wrath of God in our place. And over in chapter 2, verse 7, it says, We impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, this gospel, which God decreed or ordained or predestined before the ages for whose glory? For our glory, for those who believe in Christ. This was preordained by God for our glory. Chapter 1, verse 30. says, and because of him, or by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. Not by your doing, but by Christ's doing. You're in Christ Jesus. It's not by your intellect, not by your ability, not by your parents' influence in your life, not by your luck or good fortune, but by his doing, you are in Christ. God opened your eyes and let you put the pieces together. I'm a sinner. He's my Savior. I believe. I remember that distinctly the first time I think I really heard the gospel. I was 20 years old. I was going over the Richmond Bridge I was taking a girl to the A's game, and she starts telling me that I could be forgiven of my sin by putting my faith in Christ. I thought, obviously, she doesn't know what kind of sinner I am, and this just seems way too easy, too good to be true. This is fairy tale. This is foolish. But she was cute, so I kept going to church and kept learning about the gospel, and I realized a couple things. I realized, first of all, my sin was far worse than I thought it was. And I'm still learning about that. I'm still learning about the effects of sin and my sin. Do, do you realize your sin, when you go against God's design, when you go against the Creator's design for the world, when you go against that, it hurts the world. It hurts creation. Sin not only hurts yourself, but it hurts those you love. It hurts those around you. It affects your brain. Billions of neurons in your brain, and, and sin affects that because God created your brain. But worst of all, it's an offense to a holy God. I had to learn that. I'm still learning. Because I'm still a sinner. <laughs> Second, I learned that Jesus is way more awesome than I thought he was. That a person would live a perfect life and die. For me. And be raised again. So it took time for this message to sink in. And I think that's important for you as you share the gospel with people, as you live your life for Christ. Maybe you're here and you're learning about the gospel, you're learning about this stuff. It, it often takes time. <laughs> Something you should consider. Think about it on a human perspective, a human level, okay? You, you, we all have first impressions of people, right? Where we, we think a certain thing about certain people. But as you spend time with that person, or maybe you hear about that person, somebody tells you, like, you, your impression of that person was their, their mean jerk. But then somebody else came and said, man, this person did so much for me. They helped me out. They listened to me. They talked to me. And you're like, whoa, 
That's not the same person I know, right? And so oftentimes, even our own human impressions of people change through getting to know them and learning about them. So it is with Christ. So God opens our eyes to see these things. He calls us to himself. Verse 23 We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Jews, Gentiles, all of humanity, those who are called, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. This is the effectual calling of God, the effectual call to salvation. In John 6, 44, Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father draws him to me. And God calls people out of darkness, out of a sphere of darkness, into the sphere of his marvelous light. He calls people out of death into life. It's called vivification. It's awesome. He brings life to us. So the first path of humility is understanding God opened your eyes to believe and trust in a foolish gospel, a message that's foolish to the world. Second, and this is even more humbling, is that God uses foolish people. God uses foolish people. Verse 26, for consider your calling, brethren, And that's not a command in the Greek. Literally, that word for consider, if you have a New King James Version, it means to see. See your calling. Perceive. Look around. See who God calls. See who God saves. This is still the same 2,000 years later. Who? Who does God call? Who does God save? Not many, according to worldly standards, not many powerful, not many of noble birth, but God chose what's foolish in the world. God chose what is weak. God chose what is low and despised in the world. Even the things that are not, the nothings, God chose the nothings. God chose those who have zero likes on social media. God chose those who have two friends on Facebook, their mom and their cousin. The nothings. So God's design to humble humanity is to present a foolish message and reveal it by grace to people he calls. Secondly, he presents to the world a foolish people that he calls and redeems and transforms and sanctifies. In my life, when I came to Christ, I was 20 years old, I was in college. I went from having a 2.7 GPA in college to having a 3.7 in college. What happened? I just repented of sin. That sin that was affecting my mind and my brain I repented of that, and God forgave me, and he cleansed me by the blood of his son, washed me, and so I could just study better. (laughs) Things became clearer, made more sense. Like Christmas. Well, that's why we have Christmas, because Jesus came. Well, that's why we celebrate Easter, because Jesus rose from the dead. That's why we became a country, because people want religious freedom. Want to be able to study the Bible, not be under tyranny. All this stuff started, history, world, opened up. I liken it to the sun burning off the morning fog to see, (laughs) to see clear. The reason I get a little emotional is because (laughs) it wasn't clear for 20 years. It's hard. The way of sin is hard. (laughs) 
And then you consider who Christ chose to be his disciples. He chose the nothings. He chose the nobodies. He chose the worst. He chose the tax collector, the one everybody hated, everybody despised. Matthew, follow me. Oh, I don't know, Jesus. I'm going to give up my career. I'm going to give all that tax income. I don't know. Nobody likes me, Jesus. Why do you like me? No. What does Matthew do? Follows him. Calls dirty fishermen. Uneducated fishermen. Follow me. I don't know, Jesus. It's a good catch last week. Can't give up my dad's business. No. Instant following. Why? Because Jesus is glorious. If Jesus was standing right here and he said, follow me, you'd follow him. And for many of you, that's what's happened. He's called you. And you follow. I love Acts 14, 4, 13. <laughs> the apostles are preaching and like all the educated class and all the religious leaders are hearing these guys preach and it says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, fishermen, and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. Why? They recognized that they had been with Jesus. This is what Jesus does to people. He gives them boldness, gives them courage, gives them clarity. He chose them. He chose his disciples. They didn't choose him. He chose them. And they followed immediately to his call. It's a perfect example for us, the nobodies. So what? Okay, so, so what? God humbles all through saving foolish people, through a foolish message. So what? Okay, what's the purpose, right? Verse 31, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. That's a quote from Jeremiah chapter 9. I'm going to show you this quote from Jeremiah 9. If you're looking for a verse for like a, a New Year's verse, like this is what I want to put on my wall for the rest of this year, or maybe the rest of your life, check out Jeremiah 9.23. Thus says the Lord. Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me. But I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight declares the Lord. You want to bless the Lord? You want to make God happy? You want to delight the heart of God? Understand and know God and boast in that. Well, that's a mind blower to me. How do you understand and know the God who made all this? Who, who made acorns, Okay. <laughs> who made chicken eggs, who made your brain with a billion neurons. How do you understand this God? Okay. It seems like a, a big task. Well, here's what Paul says. Verse 30. Because of him, by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us and here's God's gifts to you. If you're a Christian, here's the gifts God's given to you, okay? He's given you wisdom from God. He's given you righteousness. He's given you sanctification. And he's given you redemption. Those four gifts 
I just want to call them gifts because he's freely given them to us, is what humanity needs the most. And as you learn about God, those four gifts, the, the wells that they are, each individual well, has no bottom. What do you mean? Well, Colossians 2.3 says, In Christ is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You want to know how to have a good marriage? You want to know how to be a good parent? You want to know how to be a good worker? You want to know how to be good at recreation? Whatever. Except sinning. God will teach you in Christ. Sanctification. This blew me away. Look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In verse 2, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those in every place, call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. He, he's sanctified us. I often think of it as my sanctification, my growth in Christ. Here's how God is sanctifying me. That's how I used to think of sanctification. But after looking at this verse, whose sanctification is it? It's Christ's sanctification in my life. I can't sanctify myself. Only Christ can sanctify me. He sets me apart. He makes me holy. It's his. Isn't that freeing? He's your righteousness. Every time you didn't do it right, he did it right for you. He's imputed his righteousness to you. So when the father sees you, he sees his son. He sees you as righteous. You can go to God and Christ anytime you want. Have confidence to go to the throne of grace because you have the righteousness of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. He took our sin, we get his righteousness. It's the best deal ever. And he's your redemption. Mark 10.45, Jesus said, the son of man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. One life, one perfect life given for the redemption of millions and millions and millions of lives. And he's redeemed you out of the slave market of sin and saved you from the judgment of God. So, those are pretty cool things, right? I mean, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. How do we learn those things? 1 Corinthians 2.10, the next chapter, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thought except the the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God that we might understand the things freely given us by God. How do you understand and know God? Through the Spirit's work teaching you about wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. 
What a joy to be a Christian. What a humbling thing to be a Christian, right? That God (laughs) revealed this to us. He opened our eyes to this. And he called a foolish people to shame the wise. Humility, okay? Humility. Don't be divisive. Don't cause division in the church because of what God has done for you in Christ. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your word. These things are difficult at times to understand. Help us to have patience as we work through these things. We thank you for the work you've done in our lives. We thank you for humbling us. I pray, Lord, that you would use us for your kingdom and for your glory, that we would be a courageous people who fight the good fight of the faith. Lord, pray for a a blessed year as we want to understand and know you. And we know that we can't know you apart from your Spirit's work in our heart and life. So Spirit, teach us. Help us to know you better. Help us to grow this year in Christ. Help us to be humble. Help us to love one another. Even our enemies, Lord. That your spirit would be strong in us, bear fruit in our lives as we walk with you. In Christ's name, amen. I want to close with this song because this song isn't necessarily a song to God, okay? When you think about this song and you sing this song, I'm singing this song to, like, Mary Jane. I'm singing it to Keith. I'm singing it to June. I'm singing it to Patricia. This song is a song we're singing to one another. We're encouraging one another with this song, okay? So I'm not saying you got to turn around and look at the person and sing to them. But it's a song we're singing to each other, all right? So let's sing together. Let's stand up and sing.